I found out it is very hard to be small in the fresh produce world. I almost went broke. I had to borrow money from, from relatives. I had to scrimp and sk- save and borrow some money from a, a rich friend of mine just to stay in, in business. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. You ever wonder what's so hard about bringing local food to our stores here in Washington? Get a behind the scenes look this week with Alan Schreiber, who grows over 300 different kinds of fruits and vegetables in a little tiny town called Eltopia, Washington. He's not only a farmer, he's also an advocate and a scientist, and he shares a ton of great information, very enlightening about the local food scene here in this conversation on the Real Food, Real People podcast. I'm Dylan Honkoop, and this is my continuing journey all over Washington State to get to know the real people behind our food. Normally, I start these conversations with people asking them about what they grow, but I think with you, the appropriate question is, what don't you grow? <laughs> you have so many different things going on here. We have a smaller group that we sell on to the wholesale market at Schreiber Farms. Mm-hmm. But then for the local market, we have a wider array of, of items. We have approximately, over the course of the season, 350 different items. So you might think beets, but we have uh, red beets, cylindrical beets, uh, <laughs> yellow beets, and some chogia, Italian heirloom beets. So we count that as four different things. So when it yeah. comes to you know, pumpkins, we'll have 20 kinds of pumpkins, and gourds, we'll have 20 kinds of gourds, and 30 kinds of winter squash, and 60 kinds of tomatoes. So... It's a very diverse operation, you know, Brussels sprouts and, you know, artichoke. Some of those don't grow as well in this climate as others. But when it comes to the, to the wholesale market, we're growing, um, you know, asparagus, chard, kale, fennel, red cabbage, uh, bok choy, and then um, eggplant, uh, mixed cherry tomato, mixed heirloom tomato, Roma, heirloom, and then... For melons, we grow a black seedless, a red seedless, a mini red personal seedless watermelon, and then we grow cantaloupe, Tuscan cantaloupe, Charente cantaloupe, peel de sapo, canary, green honeydew, orange honeydew, a Japanese white honeydew, and a couple of others that escape me. How do you keep track of it all? It's incredible. A, I have a massive set of spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a farm manager who's very, very good, an assistant farm manager, and she's very good. And I just have some very, very good people that work for me, very good people. How do you know how to grow all of these different things, too? Because every single type of, you know, kale, cantaloupe, you name it, it has different characteristics. And then the varieties, like you said, the sub, you know, you have four different types of beets. Each one of those probably has its own quirks. Okay, I grew up on a diversified Midwestern farm, which <laughs> meant it had corn and soybeans. And by the time I was 18, I was sick of corn and <laughs> sick of soybeans. And uh, I grew up looking at seed catalogs and looking at all those things that everyone else grew. And I always wanted to do that. And eventually I got myself in a situation where I could do that. And uh, through a lot of trials and errors, uh, a lot of mistakes, you, you figure it out. You figure out what, what works. You figure out that spinach doesn't grow in July, so you plant it early, and we just planted some at the end of August for a fall crop. Uh, beets grow all the time. Carrots grow all the time. Faba beans grow all the time. But you, you wouldn't grow, uh, you know, you grow peas early. You, you plant, you know, eggplant, tomatoes, and watermelons after the danger of, of the first frost is off. So you just you just learn. And you have to have some interest and some enthusiasm about going out and and trying new things. You only have so many shots at it, though, right? Because a lot of these crops, you have one shot per year. Maybe, maybe two. Correct. If it's a double crop kind of thing. Well, so bear in mind, when we're doing the, the local market, the direct market, farmer's market crop, uh, we're growing most of these on a small acreage. We have less than 10 acres devoted to the uh, highly diverse mix. And so within that, we're not growing a lot of any one crop. But, I mean, we'll grow, you know, two kinds of leeks and, you know, we'll grow 10 kinds of onions. And we've had, you know, last year we were not able to keep up with weed control and we lost our our onion crop. Now, Mm. 
that was too bad, but that was, you know, a half an acre. So what did the weeds do to the onions? Well, it, okay. Choke them out? Most, most of what we grow is organic, and we just could not keep up with the weeds. And so this year we moved our onion production onto the conventional ground, and we were able to uh, use, you know, use herbicides, and it, it suddenly became, relatively speaking, easy. Mm. So probably 98% or more of everything we grow is organic, but there are some, some things we just can't cost-effectively grow organically, and mm. we also are limited in organic space. And so there are a few things like gourds and pumpkins that people don't eat that we grow on conventional ground, and some crops like, like onions and leeks and shallots that we have to grow conventionally just because we cannot afford to hand weed it. So that's the deal. If you can't use an herbicide, you're growing organically, it's got to be done by hand. Pull the weeds well, or with a hoe or something. It, we, we have, um, we, we do, we use plastic, uh, so plastic mulch. We uh, cultivate whenever we can. The last resort is, is hand weeding, but hand weeding can cost one to $3,000 an acre. And so you really have to do that judiciously because when, when your effective minimum wage is, somewhere between $15 and $17, you have to be careful in managing your labor. You could spend all your profits hand weeding, and so you've, you've got to – hand weeding is the last resort. I think a lot of people think, oh, hand weeding, that's a lot of work, and it is. But from your mindset too, not just hard work comes to mind, but a dollar figure. You know, you can quote that cost per acre. And that's that's the calculus that you actually have to work with. Yes, I could um, I could hand weed you know everything and it would look the best. Nothing's better than, than hand weeding, <laughs> but I cannot afford to hand weed most of my crops. So and that's just the cost of labor. It's due to the cost of labor. Wow. So you have all these different crops. When does your season start? Like, what's your earliest stuff? Well, we, we start in a normal year. We will pick start picking asparagus the first week of, of April. Um, we Our local markets don't start until the 1st of May. And so at the beginning of May, we will, we're going things under plastic. Uh, and so... Uh, like little hoops? A little, little hoops that Low are... That tunnels are, or whatever they're called. Yeah, yeah um, row covers. Uh, row covers yeah. or tunnels. And so when we start picking um, in May, we'll have green, white, and purple asparagus. And by the 1st of May, we will have maybe 20 items. We'll have mixed greens. We'll have spinach. We'll have uh, a couple kinds of kale. We'll have chard. We'll have spinach, um, lettuces, a lot of leafy greens to start with, rhubarb, mm -hmm. herbs. So we, we might have 30 items by the 1st of May. And what do, I mean, what's behind us right here? Those look like watermelons. So those are many personal watermelons that are right behind us. And so we're, we're packing those into boxes. You can see the pallets in, in the back. There's uh, 45 boxes to, uh, to a pallet. And um, after that, I think we're going to uh, pack canary melons. And we also in the back are packing uh, Roma tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, and mixed heirloom and beefsteak tomatoes. And so that's all going on right now. What what will your season finish with? What's the last thing? Um, this all kind of depends on the weather, but um, oh, the other crop that we pick for the wholesale also is okra. Mm. So we will be picking okra, all of the tomatoes, and eggplant until the weather will prevent us from doing that. And so when the when the nighttime temperatures drop below. When they get into low 40s, the quality of eggplant suffers, so that will that will take them out. So we're hoping to pick eggplant until later in September. We'll pick uh, tomatoes until early October and okra until early October, weather permitting. So wow. we'll stop picking probably the second week of October, and for the local markets, we will pick until the end of October. So, again, you have kind of two sides. You have more the wholesale market. Yes. That you have a smaller, a shorter list of stuff. Yes. At, I'm sure, sure, 
much larger quantity. Um, and then the local market stuff. So is that going to like farmer's markets? Is that in stores or how do you get okay. that in on people's tables? Okay. So, uh, the farmer's market has t- turned really strong and I have to attribute it to, to COVID. Uh, mm-hmm. when COVID hit, we didn't know whether they were going to have the markets open, but people were at home and they were cooking more and yeah. and farmers market was one of the places that you could go out to and so our sales just spiked uh during covid and they did not go down we're having our biggest year ever uh for local markets we also are at a, a kenwick uh a kenwick public market uh and we are selling some to some local restaurants hmm. And we have people stop by and buy produce here every day. Wow. How far and wide then does your wholesale stuff go? Like where can people find Schreiber Farm? I mean, there's probably like multiple different brands and labels that it would so, go under. So you won't see our name. Um, it's it, This goes through brokers. Uh, our wholesale is all organic. Uh, produce follows population. And uh, so the vast majority of our produce goes across the Cascades, and most of it is consumed between Eugene, Oregon, and Vancouver Bridge, Columbia. Now, uh, we are we have been shipping small amounts of this down to California. Mm-hmm. I like nothing better than to ship, you know, eggplant and tomatoes and melons back to California <laughs> as opposed to it coming this way. So I really like that. We actually had some of sometimes it goes to Alaska. It, we had a shipment that went to Hawaii and Guam. Also, we have uh, Spokane, interestingly, is a hub. And so we have produce that goes to Spokane. And from there, it goes to northern Idaho and into Montana. I've, it goes into, and the wholesale goes into everything, grocery stores, food co-ops, um, restaurants, every place. It goes to Whole Food, uh, Safeway, PCC in the Seattle areas. Yeah. Every food co-op has our produce. Um, I was in Spokane, and our produce was in there. I was in a f- food co-op in Missoula, Montana, looking for produce, and it was there. Yeah, I thought I, I saw you post on Facebook recently. Here you're holding up something that was... Yeah. And did th- I think that particular item said Schreiber Farms on it, too. It was identifiable. Um, so on some of these places, like, like in Whole Foods and some other PCC, they will make a note of who the farmer is. And so mm-hmm. sometimes we get we, that happens, although I rarely see it because I don't get to grocery stores in other places because I'm here. But right. that, was, uh, that, was, that was nice to see. Yeah, I, we need more of that because there is actually a surprising amount of locally or even regionally produced stuff. But it, if it's just wholesale... People have no idea. The uh, people really want to have a connection to their their food, and um, meeting the farmer, knowing something about the farmer, gives you a connection to it that makes it uh, seem better. I don't know the I don't know the science or the psychology behind this, but if if you have a choice between saying I want an apple and a Washington apple, uh, people always will always take the place. That, that has a location associated with it. And if they have some kind of connection to, uh, to the grower, that's an even higher degree of, of connection. And people yeah. will always, always gravitate uh, to produce that is identified with the location and, more importantly, to the farmer. Why don't we see more of that? Is there resistance to that? Um, I think it's complicated through the, through the food chain. The, 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 the food chain and the logistics is, is stunningly complicated. We're yeah. shipping out. Um, we're not a particularly big farm, but um, during you know, August, we're shipping out a semi-load or more every day. And that load may have 12 different items, or that load may have six items from us three items from another grower and six items from another grower and one item from another grower. And it goes into a, um, into a warehouse where it gets broken down and separated. The, the, the food distribution system is amazingly complex and is a hundred percent just in time. I mean, Mm -hmm. the, we pick food and it is usually out of here the same day, the next day or two days after we pick it. It's a half day back to the sh- to the 
well, hopefully a half day or so back to the um, to the um, to the wholesaler to their mm -hmm. cold rooms, and there they will meter it out um, over a period of two or three or four days. We we pick our tomatoes not quite ripe, but we pick our tomatoes so they are at peak of perfection at seven days, mm. and um, and so it's got to move through this channel uh, from us to the wholesale to either the end user or distribution center for the end user, which then goes mm. to to the end user. And so it's it's complex and and keeping the identify the the identity with it can be challenging. Yeah, if you pick those tomatoes all the way ripe, they'd probably be puddles of mush by the time they got to people because they'd be so soft and juicy. Yes, um, and on melons, you know, th they don't ripen after you pick them. And so, you know, again, the clock is really ticking on mm -hmm. them that you, you've got to move them very, very quickly. Just want to quickly thank our sponsors here on the Real Food, Real People podcast. Um, right now, the Washington Red Raspberry Commission uh, supporting what we do. They, they say they're America's raspberries. They're all about frozen fruit. That's the bulk of the raspberries that are produced here in Washington state, which means you can enjoy their goodness all year round in all kinds of recipes. Don't forget about it, uh, frozen fruit and how important that is and how you can eat local by eating frozen red raspberries in, in well, any time of the year, Christmas time, it, the middle of February, you can have local red raspberries. Also, Mana Insurance Group, based here, founded here in the town where I grew up, Little Linden, Washington, but now they operate all over Washington State as well as in California and Arizona, founded by a guy that I went to high school with. I know a lot of the people on his team. These are great, trustworthy folks. Um, and they're all about kind of the proactive, planning ahead, having a plan to protect your financial future rather than just a reactive uh, approach, you know, to, to try to pick up the pieces when, when, if and when things go wrong. And hopefully they don't. I mean, that's the whole hope, right? But having a plan to make sure you're covered if things do is so important and responsible uh, to protect your family's future. Also, Dairy Farmers of Washington supporting the podcast, and a big thanks to them. They've been supporting since pretty much the beginning of the Real Food, Real People podcast, sharing uh, farmers' stories as well as great information about food uh, in terms of recipes, dairy-based food, uh, recipes, nutritional information, all kinds of great resources at wadairy.org. Um, they do a lot of cool stuff there, um, and they really want the truth to be known about the benefits of eating and drinking local and Washington-produced dairy products, not just milk, but cheese, yogurt, cottage cheese. The list goes on and on, and you start thinking about it, you'll get hungry right away. Um, but to, to just highlight the quality of that that we have available to us and we're so blessed with here in Washington State. Wadairy.org, check them out. Now back to our conversation in Eltopia, Washington with farmer, advocate, and scientist, Alan Schreiber. Why do you do all this? Like what, what drives your passion for this? Um, my, fa my family came to this country in 1855. Uh, mm -hmm. They've never not farmed mm -hmm. and uh, I'm fifth generation and um, I can't not do it. I simply cannot <laughs> not do it. But the, the, um, the other challenge on this is because of the, um, the cost of doing this business, the cost of going up, I mean, skyrocket. My expenses are going up. Every year we are forced to increase in size mm. just to pay our bills in, um, and that's because what, what's driving that cost? Um, our our labor costs. We we have a lot of hand labor, and that's our, our you know our cost of labor is more than equal to all of our expenses combined, mm -hmm. and and that's that goes up every year, and we can't we have no control over our cost of labor, and there's a intense labor shortage, and so it's a bidding war to get workers, and. Our fertilizer costs went up 25%. Um, our plastic 
uh, for mulch and our drip tape went up by a third. These prices are this year were extraordinarily, the increases were extraordinarily high. And so um, in each of the past four years, we've increased in size by 25%. So in four years, we've doubled in size. And uh, next year, we're we're going to expand. We're going to grow a little bit more eggplant, a little bit more tomatoes. Uh, we're going to hold flat on the, the okra and hold flat on the asparagus because of labor cost. And we're going to uh, increase significantly our melon and watermelon because there's a, a lot of demand for locally grown melon and watermelon. What is, what is stunning is in our season, so we'll say late July, August, September, uh, the Pacific Northwest doesn't supply all of its own melon and watermelon, although it could. And so mm. uh, we probably produce half or less of the melon and watermelon that we eat in the summertime. The rest comes from California and Mexico. Why? Um, it, to me, that's, you know, bigger carbon footprint. It should be more expensive. Um, they are just so big and so dominant and have these, they have these, um, it's called program cells where uh, a big company will go to a big retailer and say, I will supply you with this item 52 weeks of the year. Mm. And when they do that, um, you know, they've got 52 weeks in a year to make their money back, whereas somebody local comes in and says, well, I can supply you for 10 weeks, <laughs> weather permitting, and but i got to make all my money in 10 weeks. And so yeah. um, our prices, the local prices are higher now we have some advantage because of freight, so, but right. I but I can tell you that the um, there, there's some stiff competition from imports and and from California, and the quality from those places are not bad at all, and so um, there has to be a desire for locally grown produce, and so that's what we trade on is a desire for locally grown produce, but. When you think of Washington agriculture, we don't want everyone to think about locally grown produce because we want to sell our blueberries, our asparagus, our potatoes, our raspberries, you know, our wine grapes, uh, our hops all around the world. Right. And so if you look on the back of my hat, <laughs> if you look on the back of my hat, it says, what does it say in the back of my hat? Eat local first. Eat local first. Does, it doesn't mean eat local always if it's not doable. Everybody would starve if we ate local only. And so, you know, the mantra I have is, you know, eat local first. And so if it's local, you want to eat that. Because another thing is the closer the produce is, like like we pick our produce when it is closer to being ripe right. than they do in right. California and Mexico. So, and I, I don't mean to diss them, but in reality, ours are picked to be perfect like in seven days or something like that. They have to pick theirs earlier so it is firmer, it is harder, it will ship, it will last longer, like for melons. And so they do not have a flavor profile. They do not have the bricks or the sugars that ours do. Um, also, as produce ages, some of the nutritive value will decline over time. Mm. And, so, and also, the riper it is, the more nutrients it's going to have in it. So uh, it will taste better, it will be sweeter, and it will be better for you if you eat um, locally produced produce. Now, you can't always do that. It's not always available. There's places like where I grew up that was a food desert. And so local is better, but perhaps a more important thing is, is increased consumption of fruit and vegetables. So there's nothing wrong right. with eating a melon from Mexico or from California. It's just it's better if you can get one that's local. What makes your produce, fruits and veggies that you grow special? I'll give you a permission to brag a little bit. What? Well, what's your kind of niche? I'm not saying necessarily that organic is better than conventional, but there is a value system out there of folks who uh, place a high importance on organic produce, and so yeah. we have value because we do uh, organic produce. And remind me to tell you why we grow organically. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is, is this. Most of our produce is grown locally, is, is goes locally, which I'm going to say is the greater Northwest. And we pick our produce so it will be ripe in a very short period of time or it's 
depending on the item, it's either ripe right now or it will be ripe when it gets there. And I could give you uh, 10 melons from Mexico and California and 10 melons from our farm, and you could take a bite out of each one of those two sets of 10, and you would be able to tell in a blind test which one are ours and which one's from Mexico and California because every one of ours will always taste better than every one of theirs just because we can pick ours closer to the peak of perfection, hopefully at the peak of perfection. And we've been doing this for a while. We know what we're doing, and we're good. I mean, the reason that we're, we're increasing a little bit every year is because there's a demand for, for our produce. People want it. People, want people it. are starting to pay attention. Hey, I want good stuff. <laughs> I, I, I think so. Uh, I will tell you that, that COVID clearly, clearly, clearly uh, created an increased demand for fresh produce. Clearly did for us. I've heard that in like the berry markets as well. Yeah. That consumption of even frozen raspberries, which is the world I grew up in, is up and just has seemed to stay up. Well, ever that, since COVID. Well, and that's the same is true for for frozen blueberries as well. Um, the 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 country was out of frozen uh, berries, blueberries and raspberries. There were none available because mm. they had all been uh, sucked sucked up. The demand had had increased. You know, the other thing I want to mention was uh, why I grow organic produce. Yeah, and um, there are people that grow organic produce because they think that it's superior to conventional produce. That is not why I am growing organic produce. Mm. Um, I was a very small, I I started out with a very small farm and I started farming a little, little later in life. And I found out it is very hard to be small in the fresh produce world because we don't have the, you know, the economy of scale tells you, that as you know you get bigger your per unit costs go down i was at the punishing end of the other end of that scale where my per unit costs were very high and i almost went broke i had to borrow money from from relatives i had to scrimp and save and borrow some money from a a rich friend of mine just Hmm. to stay in in business and i i got i i got a little smaller and then i switched to organic and I was able to get more pro, more money for my produce growing organically, and I happen to grow in a, grow in an area that's easier to be organic mm. than in some other places like in Western Washington or Western Oregon. And why is that? What's easier we, about it? We have lower pest pressures. Uh, we have colder winters, hotter summers, which for a lot of pests will reduce that pest. For example, spotwing Drosophila is not as big of a problem here because our winters will uh, take out most of that insect pest. It is also very dry here. Uh, we're, we get essentially no agriculturally relevant rainfall during our growing season. Rain is nothing but a nuisance. We're all mm. irrigated. And so our disease pressure here is quite low most of the time. Now, we do have some disease problems. And we do have some insect problems. But our main pest problem, overwhelming, is, is weeds, which they're not hard to control. They're just expensive to control. Mm. And so... Um, so we can kind of dodge some of the bullets that other organic growers don't. That, so that's a, a blessing to us. So I was able to get more money for my produce uh, growing organically than I could conventionally. And so the reason I grow organic is for economic reasons. I, it, is a, it was a means of survival for us. Hmm. But, um, you know, I can tell you, if you were to do a soil test for my organic soil and for my conventional soil, right away you could tell the difference in a, in a soil test because the organic matter is twice as high in our organic soils than in our conventional soils. Mm. So, Why know, is that? Um, well, first of all, we never fumigate. Uh, we mm. fumigate some of our ground over there, and that will, that will prevent the accumulation of organic matter. And we, we put a lot more inputs into it um we we put down compost and we we put down some organic fertilizer that's kind of bulky it's instead of you know like being 32 or 42 percent nitrogen we're lucky to get 12 percent in our dry and three or four percent in our liquid and so and we're we're kind of more extreme or more intense in our crop rotations and 
it's from a number of things that we do and some of the things that we don't do that we have better, you know, soil health, soil health and higher organic matter. But it is, ex- it is expensive and it's harder to do. We also uh, grow cover crops on there to help build uh, soil, uh, organic matter and soil health. You say you don't fumigate the organic stuff. Aren't there green fumigant? processes as well I've yeah they're like mustard and there, there like are that. mustard there they're biofume against and that's a that's a, a gentler uh, way and and that's called biofumigation which is different than uh using uh, something like telone or metam sodium which are very 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 effective and you know we do use those on a conventional side uh, what is that for, like nematodes and other bugs in the soil? Uh, telone will take out uh, nematodes and wireworm. Metem sodium is more for soil diseases like verticillium, which is verticillium is easily our biggest pest problem that we mm. have. Uh, biggest soil, di- biggest soil disease problem we have is verticillium. What problem. is ver- it's like a fungus, right? Yeah, yeah. it's verticillium dallii, and it's, I mean, like. If we grow potatoes or eggplant on a piece of ground, we will never be able to grow eggplant on it again because of the verticillium. And so I am in this chase of looking for ground that's either never been farmed before, which is very rare, but we, we've done that, or ground that's never had potatoes, which is difficult around here because, because of verticillium. So how long does that stay in the soil then? Forever. Indefinitely? I, I, I don't. Let me put it this way. 20 years? I mean, if we... if where I have my eggplant on right now, I will never have eggplant on that piece of ground as long as I'm farming. Just because. Well, because why? Where does this verticillium come from? And again, it's just a fungus. It's a natural thing. Like yes. What? Yes. It, it's. But uh, it like I don't know, it comes in with the irrigation water. It, it comes in from I don't know where. Uh, you know, possibly we don't clean off the clean off the soil f- off something that we till from field to field well enough, but it gets in there. It's like spores, like a mold that uh, can spread. Well, in this case, it's, it's, it's not a spore. It's another kind of, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's uh, the means where the disease is disseminated. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's a real, real challenge to us. And so I'm, uh, I'm actually now, I can't grow eggplant on my farm. Mm. And so I'm, I go around renting uh, ground from a, neighbors of course it's got to be organic yeah. and so i'm out with suitcase in hand <laughs> looking for a, a place to grow it and i have a meeting this week week with a neighbor that's got organic ground and we're going to hope to put it on i mean p- uh, put the eggplant on some of his ground now interestingly enough this grower is a potato grower um, and so most of his grounds had potatoes but he's got some ground that he's done a lot of this biofumigation and he thinks that has driven the verticillium levels down really low. Mm. That'd be interesting to see. Well, I'm going to take soil samples as soon as we agree on a piece of ground and, and make sure. So the things you battle, weather, it doesn't sound like too much. Weather is a horrific problem for us. Yeah. Um, I, lost, I lost a quarter million dollars this year because of unusual weather. Mm. Uh, the the weather was very cold over here, and so we had a record late harvest to our asparagus. Yeah. And then, and then it was cold during harvest, and so our yields were suppressed. Mm. And then Peru and Mexico came in with asparagus and ended the season prematurely, so we only had half the season of asparagus. Mm. I also was growing leafy greens for a large retailer that name everybody would know, <laughs> and I was going to provide them seven, leafy gr- seven items of leafy greens seven items of leafy greens for three weeks for every store in Washington, Oregon for their organic supply. And so that was 15 acres, which is a lot of leafy greens. Mm -hmm. And we had unusually cold weather and it was cold for a long time. And I had had to hit a three week window. I hit it. I had to hit a three week window and the weather was delayed. And on the second day of harvest, uh, they said, we can't take any of it because you missed your window. <sighs> and so that was a $200,000 crop, and I ended up being able to get $37,000 of it sold by going around to some other folks. So weather is our number one issue, mm. easily. Cost of labor and weather. Yeah. If you fix those two, I'll be a millionaire next year. So weather has caused you to lose crop, Yep. leave crop in the field. What about labor? What, what does that force you to do? 
So, uh, unfortunately, Washington has uh, removed the exemption of overtime from agriculture. And so this year, if you work over 55 hours, you get time and a half. Next year will be 48 hours, and the following year will be 40 hours. The challenge that we have is I get, you know, $19 for a box of organic cantaloupe, whether the per- and half of that cost is labor. Mm-hmm. And I get charged the same nineteen. I get paid nineteen dollars a box, whether that person is you know making fifteen dollars or si- they'll say sixteen dollars or twenty four dollars. If they're in overtime, it's twenty four dollars. Mm-hmm. So I every time we're picking produce and I have to go into overtime, I lose money on that box of produce. Mm. And so uh, I don't. I can't get enough farm workers. We were short. Uh, we were short 13 workers, uh, so we were short about 20% of our employees. And so we were forced to go into overtime. When we went into overtime, it suddenly became marginally almost not viable to uh, pick a crop. And so we grow different crops, and we get paid different amounts by each crop. And... Um, so what I had to do was not pick the lowest value crop, which in this case was cantaloupe. And so we had to leave cantaloupe in the field because we could not afford to pick it. And that happened twice. At two different times, we were forced into this situation. And so we left thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of cantaloupe in the field. So for you, this idea of labor costs getting so expensive that you can't function anymore you can't make at least certain things viable is not just theoretical talk for you this is real talk this is the reality that you're living right now yeah i don't know how much we would have picked there but i mean i'm going to say between two and three thousand boxes were left in the field so every thousand box 19 38 Hmm. I can't do the math in my head. Yeah, um, I'm terrible at math in my head. Okay, so okay 19. Ask me to figure it out. <laughs> okay, I can't do 19,000 <laughs> times three, but uh, 38, 48, $57,000 of at least cantaloupe was left in that field. And I think there was some Tuscan melon too. So it was probably 60,000 or so of produce is left in the field. Perfectly fine. I just could not afford to pick it. Now, what's, I will tell you that the prices we're receiving for produce this year are the highest that we've ever received. So we, on some of our produce, we're at record high prices. The problem is our price increase, our, the increase in cost of production is rising faster than the price of the food. So food's gone up 10%. I mean, uh, the cost, the, the price that we're receiving for our produce may have gone up 10%, but I can tell you a lot of our costs have increased more than 10%. And so at this point, we don't know if we are in the black or in the red this year. It'll depend how the season's going. We're coming right down to the end of the season. And if the weather holds, the produce holds, the market holds, the price holds, the demand holds, um, we'll probably coast into the black. But if we have early frost, if the market demand collapses, the price collapses, um, we have a COVID outbreak, heaven forbid. We have not had a, a significant COVID outbreak on this farm, knock on wood. We had a few people go out, but mm-hmm. it didn't shut us down. So anyway. That's stress, man. I mean, think it, and and I get it because I remember plenty of years like that on the raspberry farm with my dad. It's like, we're not sure if we're going to make it this year. You know, how is this going to go? And yeah, we may lose money this year. Hopefully it doesn't happen again next year because that could be it. Yeah, I, I will tell you, someone told me, um, a very wise man, a bit of a mentor of mine named Doug Muse, told me the best farmer is two bad years from being in serious financial trouble. And mm. this year, our because our crop was delayed, but I still had all the expenses um, and I had a higher cost, I actually, I ran out of money this year and I had to go back to my banker and ask for a significant increase in my line of credit just to um, hold things together. Now, yeah. um, I bank with, with Columbia Bank, a great bank, and, and they 
helped me out. I got my line of credit extended. And well, they're very involved in agriculture, so they understand. Yeah, they how it they works. understand. They they're they're very good. Um, and uh, so I I had to get a bigger draw from from the bank and uh, hold me till my produce sales money started coming in because you know I can grow it, I pick it, I pack it, I ship it, but I don't get the money for a while. And yeah, so, probably not until it moves and then Well, it it's 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 a little complicated, but yeah. but now you know the money's coming in and more money's coming in right now than it's going out. So we're starting to pay off the bills and pay off the, you know, you got you got to pay payroll taxes and utilities first, and then other people wait, and then you try and take care of the people that are charging you interest and small businesses and mom and pops that have to make uh, things. So right now, we're this is the time of year where we're starting to pay off all the money that we have, hmm. all the bills that was have accumulated. Yeah, a lot of people will decry the the oh you know farming is caught up in this cycle of debt. Well, it's a real thing, and some people almost say that as well. You farmers, you shouldn't do that. Well, <laughs> we, we, we how have, we, how are we going to produce food? I mean that that's the the reality, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm not a very big farm, but I just the other day I was looking at what my debt is and I'm not a big farm, but overall I have a million dollars in in debt of, you know, uh, most of it's tied up with with land debt. But uh, you know I have a line of credit and I got a couple tractor loans and yeah. and so uh, you know, I I probably shouldn't be giving this kind of details, but <laughs> like I pay uh, I pay $136,000 a year to service debt. Yeah, pe- people need to realize that. Yeah, now you a lot know, of it, it is, is it's long, expensive. Yeah, I mean, most of that's tied up in land, and presuming land is going to pay for itself, and um, right. and it's you know it's not it's not bad debt. It's just what you have to do to be in this business. Now, on top of all this, and all this pressure, and all these crops to keep track of, employees, costs, everything. You also do other stuff too, which just boggles my mind how you're able to juggle all of this. You also represent multiple crops at an advocacy level. Yeah, um, so I'm I'm the administrator of a, a state research commission. I'm the executive director of the Washington Blueberry Commission and the Washington Asparagus Commission. How do you have time to do all that? I have some very excellent people <laughs> that 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 I work with. Um, also, I don't know, maybe I have a little bit of a Attention deficit disorder, <laughs> where I can, I, I, I like to have a lot of things going on, yeah. but, but these things all, all kind of fit fit together. You know, yeah. being a, a grower and packer uh, helps me relate to what growers are like. I understand the pressures they're under. I understand their their needs, and I'm a more effective advocate on issues, for example, like labor. Because I I live it, yeah. I live it. What's the research? That so I I, I have to? a I have a, a research company. You're really making this complicated. <laughs> where, where we do we do agriculture research. Before this, I was a professor at Washington State University, and mm. I took my research program, and I I privatized it, and I do agriculture research. For example, you know, the Raspberry Commission or the Potato Commission, the Onion Growers. Uh, or private companies that need agriculture research work done um, um, come to me and I figure out new ways to control verticillium wilt or wireworm or I evaluate the next hot asparagus variety. Uh, that may seem like an odd deal, but it's a really, really big deal to, uh, you know, if you plant asparagus, you're stuck with it for years and years and years, and so you want to get the best right variety. Yeah. And so... Yeah. Growers aren't in a position to evaluate all these varieties, and so we, we have, um, you know, we we do we have these ten-year trials for evaluating the next hot asparagus variety, and over a course of twenty years, um, w- that industry has changed literally based on uh, the correct selection of new varieties of asparagus, for example. But uh, we're figuring out the new best thing to control. Botrytis in blueberries and raspberries, uh, wireworm in potatoes, um, how to protect blueberries from heat damage. A lot of cool things. If you don't know what uh, farming is going to be like five or ten years from now, we can show you. 
Wow, that's cool. And then with the commissions, blueberries and asparagus, I guess, you know, I'm, I grew up around it because my dad was on the Raspberry Commission forever, the Red, Washington State Red Raspberry Commission. Um, but maybe people don't realize what those kinds of groups do. So just in a nutshell. Yeah. Just. So in, in this state and, you know, in some other states like California and Oregon, you can uh, basically petition the, uh, petition the state and they can take a vote of the growers of a commodity group. And if enough growers in number and representative in volume of vote to self-assess themselves, they will pay themselves like, uh, so, like asparagus is 1% of the value of the asparagus or on volume blueberries is uh, 4 tenths cent a pound, and it generates, you know, a few hundred thousand, depending on the crop, maybe a million or two. And that is primarily used for uh, doing research or marketing and promotion, maybe grower outreach, grower education. But the growers have to self vote to self-assess themselves to do it. And, and then it's equal, too, because it's a percentage. Yeah, it's every, not like one pays way more than the other. Well, a big unit. grower will pay more. A smaller right. grower pays commensurately less. And, you know, there's, I can't remember, there's like 22 of these commissions. You know, there, there's, you know, dairy, beef, raspberry, uh, yeah. you know, blueberry, asparagus, uh, grains, hops, uh, wine grape commission. And they're considered wildly successful. So you grew up in the Midwest. In Missouri. In Missouri. Is that how they say it there? That's what well, I've always it, been told. It, but it, it I depends can't on say where I've been you, to Missouri. It depends on where you are uh, and, and your <laughs> IQ level. Uh, where, where I come well, from, it's fairly there, low. There's, so. a, there's an I on the end of it, so yeah. I say Missouri. Oh, okay. Kind of like but, the rest of the country does then. Yeah, when, when I left, I called it misery. <laughs> so corn and soybeans. Uh, cattle, and, cattle and alfalfa. Cattle yes. and alfalfa. It was a good upbringing for me. It taught taught me the values that made me successful today. And what did you do from there? You have multiple levels of education I saw in your office wall when we were when I was first here. Um, yes, um, I think the shortest story is I had a, a family of, there were six kids or three boys and that farm wasn't gonna split three ways and I was the youngest and so I got shunted off to college and I did a, I did an undergraduate, a master's and a, a PhD and then went to work in environmental protection agency in in washington dc and then went to the other washington out here i i fell in love with this place i love the state of washington i love the pacific northwest what brought you to washington state i got hired away by washington state university to basically my my degree was in entomology study of insects and pesticide toxicology Mm. and i got hired to be the pesticide specialist for the state of washington at washington state university and i did that for several years with a research and extension program and then i Took the took my program and went private. I'm more suited for the private sector than working in the public sector. And I started a research farm, and I just couldn't leave it alone, and I started farming. It's in your blood. It is in my DNA. What did you do for the EPA? So I was an analyst on pesticide issues, specifically mm-hmm. insecticide issues. Um, I worked on GMO crops. I worked on integrated pest management projects. And I looked at I, a lot of what I did was looked at the impact of pesticide cancellations uh, was really what I got big on. And Like one pesticide canceling out the effects of another? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Uh, there's this product called ethylparathion, and there was about 70 crops. It was really heavily used on 12, and then there's another 58 that was kind of called specialty crops or minor uses. My friend uh, worked on the, the big crops. I worked on the little crops. And I remember one of them was currants. Remember, I'm from corn and soybean country. Mm-hmm. And what the he- I didn't even know what a current was. And so, you know, we weren't able to dig up information on that on that on the use of that products on these minor crops but they were able to show the value of it on these these big crops you yeah. know maybe like i don't know corn or cotton or right. soybeans and so they end up canceling it on the minor crops and keeping it on the the major crops well about six months later or less i was a newly minted assistant professor at washington state university and one of my first calls i got was from a current grower about 30 miles away and said some idiot in EPA canceled ethylparathion on currants and I don't have anything to control the current cane borer. 
And I was like, oh, my God, that was me. It was <laughs> me. I'm not kidding. This is a true story. And so I worked with this guy and worked with WSU. And we ended up when getting, did you tell him that it was you? I never told him that. <laughs> I could not bring myself to tell him that story. I just said, I'm going to help you. And so I worked uh, with, you know, Department of Agriculture and EPA and doing some research and we and uh, IR4 program and got a new product registered to control the current cane borer. At least you made it right. Yes, I made it right. <laughs> Well, you probably know all kinds of stuff. I mean, th- those are some hot button issues in there. You know, pesticides, GMOs. Yep, labor. Yep. All right, at EPA, yes, uh, <laughs> yes, I was involved in a lot of uh, hot button issues. Resistance to insecticides was another one. What? What? What should the just thirty thousand foot level? What should people know about their food and and pesticides? As long as pesticides are used according to the label, which overwhelmingly they are, uh, they don't pose an unreasonable risk to human health and the environment. So you shouldn't be afraid of pesticide residues on your, on your produce because even when they check it, the residue levels are well within, in, within the limits. And if your value system is of such that you want to minimize your exposure even further to pesticides, easy. Just take orga- eat organic produce, and, and that will essentially remove any potential risk. And so oh. our food supply is, is safe. Um, people shouldn't be concerned, in my opinion, about pesticide use on their produce. They should be concerned about whether they're eating enough. The, the problem is mm-hmm. not eating enough uh, fruits and vegetables is, is a much bigger issue than any potential risk from pesticides. Right, yeah. You don't eat fruits and vegetables, so you end up, what, eating ultra-processed carbohydrates? Which, and is, <laughs> which is terrible, absolutely yeah. terrible for yeah. you. Uh, it's, you know, salt, fat, um, things we don't even know, can't even pronounce. So <laughs> Michael Pollan said you shouldn't eat anything that has more than five ingredients in it. There you go. Alan, thanks for having me here. I'm sure you've got a million things to do with everything you've got going on, but I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing some of your wisdom on all of us. It's been uh, fun and very interesting. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. These are the stories of the people who grow your food. 